Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is CJ Wilson, former all-star baseball player, car nut, and Bitcoiner. We talk about his journey to being a major league baseball player, the mechanics of throwing a ball, and how he overcame various injuries and setbacks. CJ also tells us about the mental side of baseball, what it takes to get to a high level, and his journey as a Bitcoiner. CJ is a really funny guy who I didn't know was an all-star pitcher until I got to know him on Clubhouse. As you'll hear, he's very entertaining and has an outlook on life that I really admire. His story of overcoming adversity hopefully can inspire you to persevere. CJ Wilson, how's everything going? Good, Jimmy. I'm happy we connected on Clubhouse. I've been very interested in Bitcoin for a long time, so it's really cool to be shooting an AK-47 with orange pills coming out now as a result of yourself and others. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Back up. You're oh. shooting an AK-47? What's going on? That's what it feels like. It feels like since connecting to all these other Bitcoin people and, you know, I, I would say aficionados, investors, hodlers, toxic maximalists, it's been great. I felt like I've been on my own journey for so long and now I have a team. It's mm. A bunch of us are in the same boat. Mm, indeed. And that brings me to sort of like your profession before what you're doing now, which is baseball. You were an all-star major league baseball pitcher. So can you tell us a little bit about like what that was like and how you eventually found your way to Bitcoin? Yeah, I would say that, you know, as a baseball player, I developed the concept of a career at a very young age. I always wanted to make something of myself, I wanted to be a big deal as a baseball player. And I felt like a lot of people told me it was a crazy idea. A lot of people told me statistically it was impossible. And I just looked at it as, yeah, there's these other guys doing it. Maybe I can learn something. Maybe I can, you know, get better practice, practice, practice and perfect something. And that's kind of how it happened. I mean, I really, I, I got a late start. I didn't play t-ball. I didn't play coach pitch. I didn't do any of that normal, like Americana stuff. I literally just played wiffle ball in the backyard of my dad until I was old enough to play kid pitch when I was about nine. And I was so bad that the coach told me to quit and play soccer. <laughs> and at that point, I wasn't really that discouraged because I had a mental approach to say that, you know, I'm going to do this. I'd already kind of committed to it. And then I academically started learning about it, reading baseball books, some of them with pictures, some of them not, and really learning about how to have a more professional approach. Because a lot of these books are written by people that are in the space, you know, professional guy that hits for the, you know, Wade Boggs, the technique of modern hitting. Basically, he played third base and was the batting champion for the Red Sox for a couple of years. So he wrote a book, I read it. And then the next year I went out and smashed it. And I was like, well, there must be something to this. So then I just started really devouring books and that set me on a really good path, understanding that academics could lead me as long as I was able to let my imagination soak up the right kind of knowledge. Mm. There's something about like adversity and you just sort of fighting that adversity with knowledge that's very inspiring, actually. So what happened at that point as you continue to grow as a baseball player? Then I started developing rivalries, which was very important because then it gave me somebody to play against and somebody to chase somebody to measure myself against, which I thought was very interesting because with baseball, there's so many statistics, although the moms and dads in the stands aren't necessarily keeping the most accurate statistics. As a hitter, you know, hey, I got a hit today. I got two hits today. As a pitcher, you know, hey, I struck out seven guys, whatever it is. And I think that was something that allowed me to measure up and be honest and say, hey, I didn't get it done today. I sucked. I lost. And as a result of that, I took accountability for my games. You know, maybe too much accountability, according to my dad at the time, but I became a worker. And that's when I realized, hey, with enough practice, I can get better. And I had particular rivals, like at every stage, maybe every year, there was another player, maybe the best player on another team on that day, or just another player in the league that was sort of physically comparable to me, but maybe threw a little bit harder or hit, the, hit more home runs. And I would try to figure out how to take them down, how to tear them apart, and then, <laughs> you know, how to scout them. Wow. You actually had like people in mind as you were playing these games. Oh, specifically, yeah. There was this kid named Andrew Rodriguez that was like the same size that I was when we were maybe 11 or something like that. And he was a star player in the league. And I was a good player. I wasn't the best player. But 
he was kind of like the hot shit and he had a really good slider. And even though we weren't supposed to really like throw too many sliders, it, but he was really the best player that was sort of my physical size. There was other kids that were way bigger. And I looked at it like, okay, well, his swing is kind of trash, but he's so big. If he connects, it's just a home run. But I figured out what his weaknesses were like as a hitter and as a pitcher. And then the most satisfying thing was going up against him, you know, in a game and getting a hit off him and striking him out in the same game. It was pretty much the most baller thing I did as probably like a 12 year old. <laughs> so <laughs> you had these rivalries. That's interesting that that was what drove you was this competition and this desire to beat somebody. And despite not having been the best or having an early start, you figured out ways to beat these guys. Was that a pattern throughout your career? Totally. Yeah. Because there's always people you're measured against, right? You can't be the best if someone's better than you. And if you want to be the best version of yourself, statistically in baseball, right, it's a very, very long odds. So we had a guy named Don Larson who threw a perfect game in the World Series for the Yankees in 1956. He came and talked to us in Little League. And, you know, this is 1990 or something. That's we're talking like 34 years later. So he's probably like at that point, you know, late 60s or something and maybe, you know, 60 years old or whatever at the youngest, but he said, Hey, listen, only one in every 29,000 kids that plays little league will make it to professional baseball. And I literally looked around. And I was like, fuck these guys. I like, <laughs> I got to figure out how to do it. You know, I, I better figure this out. And that was a big motivator for me. Cause I knew it, it's a win loss thing. Like you're up against somebody it's zero sum, like you either make it or you don't. And someone, there's only so many spots on a roster, just like there's only so many you know, so many pitches that you can throw in your arm before your arm falls off. So I just felt like I had to get my quality up and the mental side of things really helped me a lot because I was able to really memorize things and like visualize things and think about scenarios. Oh, if there's a runner on second base, you know, and I want to do this. If there's a runner on third base, I need to do that. And I understood the game pretty well because I understood what the objective was to score more runs and the objective is mm. to not give up runs. So mm -hmm. as a, I, but I played both, I pitched and I hit. So I was kind of like getting extra reps in, you know what I mean? Because I was a customer on both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. Well, so you mentioned rivalries, you mentioned sort of like learning strictly through books, but you also mentioned something else, which I found interesting, which is this ability to reflect on your performance and figure out what you did wrong. And instead of just sort of glorying in the fact that you won or something like that, just actually going through and critiquing yourself and correcting those. Uh, what was that process like and what led you to do that? Did you ever see, I think it was Bloodsport when Van Damme was like learning how to do, you know, some of the more advanced level stuff and his sensei was like dropping coconuts on his stomach or something like that. <laughs> I always felt like there was an element of like practice that you can't get by and you have to just withstand a certain amount of torture and self-flagellation. So I took it upon myself to, you know, get that practice and get those repetitions in. And for me, when I was not happy with my performance, I would go into the backyard and I would just swing and I would just practice my swing, practice my swing, practice my swing. And we had a, uh, like a block wall and I used to throw tennis balls against the block wall and sort of practice my accuracy. So I'd pick like a particular brick and I'd say, okay, I'm going to hit the top left corner of this brick or the bottom right corner of that brick or whatever with my eyes. And I would like look at it and stare at it and try to be accurate the same way, like a sniper or anybody shooting a gun tries to work on their accuracy with their vision and, you know, their movements. It was very similar for me, but for me, I would do it in a, like in a non game way for me, it was like mechanical. I was like learning how to perfect my body motion and, and how to like really like feel everything. So I understood like what phase, like how was I really going to twist and turn? Because baseball is a lot of like twisting and turning. So you have to learn how to use what I like to call elliptical acceleration, where like a figure skater, when they do like, like a toe loop or something and they jump off of the ground or off the ice, they have to like stick one leg out and then jam it down. And then that like jamming effect and twisting with the arms and the hips and everything like that, that's what adds to the like, you know, you know, circular force or the torque that they can mm. come off the ice with. So you have to learn how to use your body like a spring and coil and uncoil. And baseball is very similar to that because you're standing kind of still and you have to use the ground force to generate the force out of your hand, you know, or through your hands with the bat. And so at a very young age, I learned how to really kind of like work my body, pause, but the thing is that that really helped me because I was a very small guy. And so I, I was able to kind of like punch above my weight 
And then I would also do like feats of strength in the backyard where I would literally try to like break cinder blocks and like smash things to get my just normal, you know, 11 to 15 year old rage out uh, in a productive manner. <laughs> but I would also do things like I would bribe my brother and we would ride our bicycles to the high school and I would crawl under the fence. And then like I figured out a way to bend up the chain link fence and then slide underneath. And then we would turn on the pitching machine and then he would just sit there and feed baseballs into the pitching machine. And I would hit for like two hours and I would give him a dollar. And then <laughs> uh, that was it. So and then we would go to 7-Eleven and drink like Slurpees and talk about video games or something like that. <laughs> wow. So good time. So, all right. So you're developing as a baseball player. You get to high school. What happens then? Well, yeah, I was still like a really small guy. So like freshman year high school, I was 5'2", 105 pounds. First day of class, I could do like one pull up and maybe like, I don't know, one bar dip and, and maybe, you know, 20 push ups or something like that. So I realized, hey, these other kids that I'm up against are bigger and stronger than me. I got to figure it out. And that's where I sort of developed a orthorexia, which is actually a like compulsive overeating. I don't think I really had it to the point where I was going to be on my 600 pound life, but I just was like <laughs> trying to get bigger all the time because it was all baseball. I was like, I have to get bigger so I can get stronger, so I can throw harder, so I can hit the ball to the fence. And, you know, so I was always trying like new things to test myself and, you know, pushing myself further and further. But I would say that being an underdog and feeling like a late bloomer kind of put a chip on my shoulder. And when these other kids that were bigger and stronger than me, sometimes they even just quit baseball. They were way better than I was. And they just quit because mm. they're like, yeah, I'm going to go hang out with this chick. And then like completely derailed. I saw a lot of other people get derailed. And just from social stuff, you know, they started drinking, they started partying, started hanging out with like hot chicks. And I was a nerd. I didn't have any friends. So it was very easy for me just to kind of pile myself into baseball because that was the only thing I really had as an identity at that point. I got really good grades and stuff. I was always a studious kid, I, but I always got like the minimum that I needed to get like whatever GPA I set as a target. I think that was just sort of my my version of things. But I, I was always a hard worker. I always wanted to get things done. I just knew that I had to focus on baseball and eating more food and swinging more and hitting more and running more and lifting more weights. And that always just drove me. Mm. And during high school, you developed even more. What was that like? And then like getting to college and getting, you know, pitching there and, and so on. What was that like? Yeah, I would say the funny thing is that my high school coach and I didn't get along all the time and to the point where I got kind of like kicked off the pitching staff when I was a senior. So then I just played outfield after that, which because I got in a fight with the pitching coach where I he wouldn't even watch me warm up before the games. So he would be calling the pitches or trying to call the pitches. And I would refuse to throw some of those pitches because I felt like he wasn't paying attention. So he would just call random shit and I didn't like it. I wanted a better explanation and more preparation. And I had the feel to know what I was doing. I was very studious. I was like, oh, this guy is late on my fastball. I don't want to throw him something slow because then he's going he's gonna to smoke it. And that logic never really worked with the pitching coach. So I ended up just playing center field and left field uh, about halfway through the season. And then realizing I needed to be in a capitalistic scenario where I could determine my own fate and be let, I could be allowed to fail so that way I could, you know, learn. Because you can't learn by being protected and coddled. It's not going to work. Mm. Hmm. Well, so what were you coddled from? What was the thing that they were trying to protect you from? Yeah, well, the, the pitching coaches think that they're really smart. And so they tell you what to throw. And then if you don't want to throw that pitch, they think you're either a pussy or an idiot. And <laughs> of course, if they're calling a pitch that you don't think is a good pitch to throw, you think they're an idiot. So then it turns into an ego thing. And I say to them something along the lines of, hey, this is my career. I'm worried about this, that, and the other. I'm focused on getting better as a player and better as a pitcher. I don't think I should be made to throw that pitch or this many pitches in a game or whatever. And I would get sent home sometimes from okay. practice. I actually got kicked out of some games. Wow. Okay. And then what happened to, uh, after that? Like, what was the progression at yeah, that then, point? Then it was great. I mean, I had a couple of injuries and stuff like that along the way. Like I hurt my knee and hurt my back and stuff. But when I went to junior college, they just let you play and they enforced self-discipline, which was a really interesting concept because I, the, my coach at the time, his name was Don Snedden. And he said, listen, I could discipline you guys. I could hit you with a rubber hose until you do what I want you to do. Or you can learn self-discipline. And then when my back is turned, you're going to be doing the right thing. And when you do the right thing, then, you know, you'll get better. And that'll make you more of a man because that's real life. Real life is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And I was like, holy shit, what a concept. This guy is going to let me play because I'm trying to work. I'm trying to do the right thing. And that system, it was amazing for me. And then that was when I really kind of bloomed, I would say, fully. 
And like my sophomore season there, I won every award. I did everything right. I was the, you know, this, the MVP of the team, the league, the state and every, I won like all the awards. And I think it was just as a result of like, if I wanted to stay till seven o'clock at night and hit in the batting cage, they would let me, they wouldn't send me home. They weren't like trying to go to the bar. They were like, Hey, that's cool, dude. You want to get better? Here's the key. Here's the combination of the lock. Like you can lock Hmm. it up. And so that the batting cage at my junior college is like the CJ Wilson, you know, batting cages or whatever. Cause I probably spent more time there. You know, I, I spent more time there than anybody else. Hmm. Well, so you mentioned a couple of injuries and this to me is sort of like the crux of your story. And the reason like, I was like, oh man, I got to have this guy on my podcast. Cause you mentioned those injuries and the way you overcame them for me was extremely inspiring. So can you describe, uh, at least up to that point, what injuries had happened and what led you to overcome them? Yeah. So my senior year, I got mono, I got mononucleosis, like about three quarters of the way through my senior year of high school. And then in summer ball, a couple months later, I got in a collision and kind of blew my knee out. And that was bad. I mean, I was to the point where I thought I was going to have to have surgery. So I had a partial tear in my ACL mm. and, and that was pretty crappy because obviously I was an outfielder and had to run and pitch and stuff like that. But it really solidified like the, I guess, going back to the Van Dam thing, like the pain tolerance thing, it made me realize that if I can push through or if I'm willing to push through pain, then I can, you know, I can get better and heal and make adjustments and stuff like that. You know, and then the real crusher was my freshman year of college, I, I had a broken back. I stepped on second base really weird one day and my back slipped out of place and my L5 got a stress fracture in it. And I crumpled down and, and fell apart basically. So coming back from that was arduous. You know, I missed basically the like three quarters of my freshman year of college and then some of the summer and I had to wear a back brace, you know, constantly, but I didn't really ever let go of my dream. So while I was like basically limping around and walking like a robot for months and really kind of, you know, you're 18 years old, you're angry at the world, you know, all that stuff. I said, Hey, it doesn't matter. I have to find a way I came through the knee injury. I should be okay. You know, I can do this. I came through the knee injury. I can come through the back injury. It's the same shit. And I did. And I really, I put everything I could into my physical therapy. I put everything I could into eating right. And, you know, I didn't let anything take me off course in that regard. I just doubled down. Every time things got harder for me, I said, well, I'm going to do it anyways. This other guy told me I was, I should quit and play soccer. Like what's a knee injury? Like I'm going to come back. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I saw a lot of people fail in like big moments and not psychologically be able to recover. There was a kid that was a shortstop for our little league team. And I'll never forget this. He struck out to end the season and he never played baseball again. And he was like the all-star shortstop for the team. Like he was a really like for the league that we were in, he's a really good player, but he decided to go play football instead. And so I think what happened was I saw that all these other kids that had like an outlet or like another sport or some other thing, they would just be like, I'm going to take my ball and go home. And they sort of just like walked away. And if they didn't achieve that success that they expected to, right? Because it was like, then they had an excuse. I never felt like I could do that because I had already committed it as like an eight year old to being this baseball player guy. You know, I printed this thing out on a typewriter and handed it to my mom and I said, this is what I'm going to do. And she's like, oh, that's cute, honey. (laughs) And so I basically, I let everybody know. I think that was, that's one of the keys of a goal is you have to let other people know what your goal is. Even if it's audacious, you have to have people holding you accountable for that. And I, I think that was a big thing for me was, was staying accountable to my own dreams. And as a result of that, I never let it go. Even though, you know, I had tons of up and downs. Like I said, the knee injury, I had like a 50% tear of my ACL and I rehabbed it, didn't have surgery. I had the, the back injury, rehab, no surgery. Then I dove for a ball and shattered my hand. I did have to have surgery for that. And that was actually kind of cool because then I was like, oh, well, I got like screws in my hand now. So I'm like bionic. And then I I stopped really worrying about injuries. It was kind of like not worrying about the dips in Bitcoin because you just have this really long time preference. Because my whole thing was like, I need to be somewhere when I'm 30. I don't need to be somewhere when I'm 18 or 19. That's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. You know, anything that happens in the early days, high school, college, I just need to keep going and keep getting bigger and keep getting stronger. And as I physically got bigger and stronger, you know, and then the scouts started kind of paying attention. And then by the time I was probably like a, I guess, a junior in college as a 20 year old, then I was, you know, like pushing just about 200 pounds and I was throwing 91, 92 miles an hour. 
then I was kind of on the scene, you know, but I wasn't one of those freak kids that throws really hard and is really big as a, you know, as a 13 year old, I, that wasn't me at all. Mm. So you worked your way up. And one of the things that's really fascinating to me is that you saw so many people fail. Like there were people that were very talented that you saw, but like they either took their ball and go home. Like what kept you and not them? Like, was it dedication, having goals? Was it just grit? What was it, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, personality type wise, I'm a little bit more introverted than people. So a lot of my motivation is intrinsic and it's not requiring anybody else to like validate it, you know? And I remember there's one kid named Brandon that was a much better player than I was. And he was another, you know, like shortstop in high school. And he was like a big, tall kid. He could hit for power. He could throw pretty hard. But, you know, he kind of fell in love with a cheerleader or something like that and ended up wanting to play football. And then he played, you know, then he played football and he was a big physical guy. So being a big physical guy playing football made a lot more sense than, you know, having to work on learning how to hit a slider in baseball. And I just was like, this guy's quitting. What an idiot. Like he's an <laughs> idiot. And then I realized that my high school culture that I, where I went, where I started was Edison high school in Huntington beach. It was kind of toxic because it had all these like sort of hippie burnout people and people that were going to peak in high school. And I didn't want to be around that anymore. So I transferred to Fountain Valley high school in the middle of the school year, my sophomore year. Their, their team was really, really good. Fountain Valley was nationally ranked. It was like one of those things where the stars sort of aligned and I was able to utilize the, the redistricting rules. And my dad moved into the Fountain Valley School District. We were actually rival high schools. So it's like, it'd be like going from Coke to Pepsi, right? I mean, it was like one of those <laughs> things that football, they would like actually prank the schools. So they would like, do crazy stuff like, you know, pranking the schools, uh, you know, Found Valley would prank Edison, Edison would prank Found Valley. And it was a huge rivalry. So when I transferred, it was like this weird, everyone's like, whoa, what the hell? Like, where, why did you do that? And I was like, I'm here to play major league baseball. I don't give a shit about high school cheerleaders or <laughs> kids. I don't care about that at all. I need to focus on me getting better and all that. And Found Valley had better facilities. They had their own weight room. They had a better pitching machine that you could hit off and all that stuff. And they had more, they had more talent. So I went there and, and I played junior varsity my sophomore year. And it was eye opening because then I got to see a lot of really talented players up close, kids that were division one or draftable kids. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, now I have new people to model myself after people that I couldn't really compete with physically because they were bigger, they're stronger, but you know, they had like seven kids go to division one baseball after high school. And you know, that was a big life lesson for me to see these guys in person because they were dedicated and it was better academic school. Like I had a, I don't know, like a 3.7 GPA or something like that. And we had 600 kids graduate. And I wasn't even in the top like 250 in my class. So it was like academically, it was better challenge as well. We had way less like surfer stoner kids and way more kids that were trying to get into Ivy League schools and stuff like that. Hmm. Well, so you ended up going to junior college and then you win all those awards as a sophomore. What happened then at that point? This is the funny part, right? Because I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm a stud. I'm a right fielder, a center fielder. I'm a pitcher. Like I hit home runs. I steal bases. I strike people out. Like I'm kind of a boss. You know, I feel like I'm a pretty good player. Like the scouts are like, okay, so, you know, we would like to draft you. Do you have any expectations like financially or whatever? And I'm like, well, I'm going to the school. I got a scholarship to go to Loyola Marymount. It's like 30 grand a year. So as long as I'm getting like 100 grand or something like that, I'm pretty much okay. I'll, I'll sign, you know, if I can get yeah. 100 grand. And apparently that was the wrong answer and I didn't even get drafted. <laughs> so that was demoralizing. Like, I'm like, okay, I literally, I hit like 450, you know, my batting average was like 450. I hit like all these home runs. I, st I did like literally statistically, I was like a great player. And I'm like, these guys don't even give a shit. Like they don't care. They didn't even draft me. This is bullshit. So why, why um, was that the wrong answer? Just curious. Apparently the answer is I'm just ready to sign. I just want to play pro baseball. Put me in coach. I'm ready to play. That's the answer. <laughs> So I learned that, you know, and then, but that summer I went to go play in Alaska because they have a summer league in Alaska and I was the closer on the team, the center fielder, you know, it was all fun and games. Um, I was like leading the team in batting average. And then I got in a collision running to first base. I hit a ground ball and the second baseman did like this weird little flip maneuver and he kept running and like ran into me as I was running past first base and his right elbow hit me right in the spleen. And then I went down like a bag of hammers 
And, uh, you know, I went back out to center field the next inning to try to like, you know, play defense and I almost fell over. So I had to go to the hospital and I stayed in the hospital for five days with a splenic hematoma, which was like really the most obscure injury I'd ever gotten <laughs> considering I'd grown up skateboarding and, and BMX biking and all that stuff. And then I get elbowed in the freaking spleen by the, this little dude that was going to Pepperdine named Dave. Uh, no, no, who was, what was his name? Martinez. Anyways. So so yeah, I get smoked in there. I'm in the hospital and then I have to get sent home. And I'm just like, okay, this is bullshit. Like every time I take a step forward, I get like, cr- you know, cracked in the neck or something like that. Like it's just always this like slap, you know, to my dreams. But I think I was like, I came back from a broken back. Like what's a bruised spleen? Who gives a shit about that? So I went home, I started working out, I got ready for the season. And then I went to Loyal Marymount in LA and, you know, when you're a transfer, like a sophomore transfer, and for me, it wasn't like an academic thing at all. It's just financial. Like I couldn't afford to go to college. Like we didn't have enough money as a family to, you know, pay 20 or 30 grand for me to go to a real school. And with baseball only giving, you know, 11.7 scholarships for the whole team to distribute, you don't really get a full ride, right? So I had gotten a full ride after my sophomore year because I did so well. And so I didn't have to pay to, to go to college, which was cool. And I just had to pay for like my food or something like that, which is really neat. So I signed up for the film and screenwriting major, a double major with like psychology and international business. I don't know what I was planning on doing with all those three things, but I guess, you know, doing cartoons for like maybe a Bitcoin ETF one day, maybe that'll be the peak. Of it. <laughs> but yeah, so I, you know, went to school and that year our team was so terrible. It was like, it was the worst team I'd ever played on at any level, like the worst team, the, the worst coach. It was just brutal. And the coach was trying to like strong arm me into coming back from my senior year. And I was like, why the fuck would I want to come back to this shit show? Like, this is terrible. Like I want to go to pro ball. So when the scouts came around this time, I was like, dude, I just want to get out of here. Just like, get me out of this nightmare situation. You guys watch us play. You know, we suck. Like, let me go play against like the best players in the world. And they were like, Ooh, right answer. So then I get drafted in the fifth round and end up getting like a $200,000 signing bonus which is pretty swanky when you're 20 years old, you know? Mm. So I, you know, I got a 20 or, you know, set myself on a, like a little bit of a budget. I gave myself about 20 grand to live off for the next year and a half. And then I, I said, if I 20 make grand it, over a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. 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 Air mattresses, top ramen, you know, like making it work. And then I got a job in the off season, you know, I would work in the off season, but when you playing minor league baseball, you make eight fifty a month before taxes your first year. At least this is 2001. So this is way back then. Mm-hmm. And then I get moved up because I'm doing really well because I was motivated. I was like, I don't want to be in this shithole. Like, you know, this is a shitty place to be. I'm on an air mattress. Like my neighbor got arrested for being a crack dealer. Like I need to get out of this, you know, <laughs> this rookie league situation. And then I got moved up to Savannah, which is like a real city. And being that I'm just fresh out of college, you know, I watched the game from the stands because I like got there you know, middle of the game or something like that. I watched it and everybody's batting average was terrible. It was like 205, 225, 230. So after the game, this is me as a 20 year old, right? This is where I think this is where my fucking head's at. I go and I tell the coach, I'm like, Hey, Pedro, man, honestly, like you guys might need me as a hitter. Like your hitters suck. Like, you know, nobody's <laughs> like, th- these guys are really bad. And he's like, listen, like that's cute. But I'll tell you what, if you throw a shutout, then I'll let you take batting practice. So I was like, mm. oh, yes, you know, so mm-hmm. I'm on that team for a little while. I, we end up throwing a shutout as a team. They give me batting practice. I end up hitting like a bunch of home runs and I like flip the bat. I'm like, see, I told you, like I could have been scoring you guys runs and you guys are losing. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of back to that anti-authority thing. Although Pedro was actually <laughs> a really good coach and Andy Hawkins, the pitching coach was great. I made some really good connections because now all of a sudden I'm playing in a very capitalistic situation where the best players are incentivized to hang out with each other sort of feed off each other and all win together. And so that's when I became kind of like best friends with a guy named Lance Nix and a guy named Jason Botts. And those two guys were like really big prospects at the time. So the three of us were sort of like the three amigos. And then we, you know, we would like work out together on the road and, you know, talk about stuff and we would share books. I mean, like we're on like the bus and we're reading like the power of now, you know, (laughs) and like all these stuff and we all like Star Wars. So we would like alternate between like a Star Wars book and then like the power of now or something like that. And then we would like share books with each other. And we had like a little bit of like a nerd book club, but we were the three best players on the team. So it was kind of funny Then everybody else was just talking about how much they could drink and like, you know, on the bus rides and just doing, you know, just straight up, like, I guess, a super bad level partying. The three of us were very contained and constrained and focused on our 
physiques and getting stronger and stuff like that. So I realized very quickly, okay, I need to get in with a good crowd. You know, now I have a fresh start and, and that worked. And then the next season, I said, if I make it to double A by the end of this, which is, would, would have been my first full season, I'll buy myself a really cool car. And that was a big carrot for me. So my first spring training, I go there and in that, on that team, the Rangers in 2002, it was like Alex Rodriguez, Pudge Rodriguez, Juan Gonzalez, Ruben Sierra, John Rocker, Kenny Rogers, all these super gnarly, like veteran players. And I'm watching these guys work out, Rafael Palmero, And like, you know, half of those guys ended up testing positive for steroids at one point or whatever. <laughs> so I was like, I was watching those guys work out and I was like, damn, is that how big and strong I have to be to be good? Holy shit, this is wild. But I saw real you know, major league hall of fame level athletes, all-star athletes up close for the first time. And then I was like, okay, that's what I need to do. So, you know, I would actually watch the major league spring training games anytime I could get a chance. Cause for me, it was like, okay, well, this is scouting. I need to figure out how to get these guys out. And, you know, I became a very good student of the game. And then I ran into more coaching problems because of stuff like I wouldn't cut my hair or, you know, I wasn't like determined to be presentable on a daily basis. Cause I would like stay up all night prepping for a game. I wouldn't really think about Oh, I'm clean shaven or, you know, oh, I have a mullet, like, you know, or my hair's not combed because I just wouldn't comb my hair. Like I still don't. <laughs> so it's just one of those, it, it, like, I always look like the guy that I am, which is like a t-shirt, a hoodie, and then like, you know, foot flops or something. That's, that was, that's like my default setting. And so, you know, being from a beach city, that's just sort of how I dress. And that just wasn't cool for like these Southern guys that were like, oh, you have to like tuck in a, a pastel colored polo and you have to wear Sperry's boat shoes and you know, you got to do this. And I was just like, you guys are fucking lame. Like, I don't give a shit about any of that. Like, I care about my ERA and my strikeouts. Like, that's what matters. Not my freaking wardrobe. You know, you guys are lame. Hmm. Well, I mean, so did you end up like hitting at all in double A or were you just like, did they put you back no. as a pitcher? No, they never let me because we were an American League team. So I still practice. I'd go home in the offseason to my junior college and I'd still work out and practice because I would say, hey, I'm going to play in the majors one day. We we're going to play interleague games. I got to keep my swing ready and I would literally still work out as a hitter and as a pitcher, you know, every off season. But the next time I got a chance to hit in a game was 2010, which was literally nine years after I got drafted. <laughs> All right. So you're in junior college, you go to Loyola and then you get drafted and you're in double A at this point, you have a nice car and you're hanging out with some really good players. What was the call up to the majors like? Yeah. So I got called up to the majors after my next injury, which was 2003. So 2002 mm. was like a dream season. I moved up. I was an all-star in high A ball in the Florida State League. And I played against players like Jose Reyes and like all these, I mean, Alexis Rios, like all these like real major league talented players. Like, and I was like, oh, these, you could see it. Like, you're like, okay, this guy's a legit, he's going to make it to the majors. Like I need to get him out. I need to strike him out. Mm. And so I figured out how to play against those guys at that level. And I thought it was cool, you know, like, okay, now I'm with real star players. So the next year I start the year in double A and things start off pretty well. You know, I'm pitching. Okay. My arm starts to hurt a little bit. I throw like a complete game against a team where I think I gave up like one hit and Lance was the center fielder, my, like my best friend. And he kind of didn't dive for a ball. And that's how I lost a no hitter because he played it like safe instead of like diving and maybe blowing it and costing us the game. So afterwards he was like, fuck man, I should have dove for that ball. And I'm like, dude, you did the smart thing. It's fine. I said, who cares about a no hitter in double A anyway? It's like, it's not a really big deal. I don't want you like getting hurt, you know, diving for a ball, you know, on this shitty ass grass. So I had some highlights, but then, you know, in like July, my arm really started hurting like a lot. And mm -hmm. I kept trying to pitch through it because that's what I'd always done. And then eventually what happened was I go to the doctor and they're like, yeah, you need Tommy John surgery and you're going to miss at least a year. You are, you know, it's, hey, it's totally fine. We usually fix this. There's like a pretty good rate of people getting back to where they were. And I'm like, well, I'm on this like accelerated improvement path. I don't want to go back to what, how I am now. Like I'm not good enough now. I need to get better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so then I have to get surgery and I did what was probably the smartest thing I did in my whole minor league career which was I demanded to get my surgery from Lewis Yoakum out in Los Angeles instead of getting my surgery from the team doctor. And mm -hmm. the team doctor at the time had like, I think just gotten there and he didn't really have like the, I mean, he had like the training or whatever, but he wasn't really on the level of like, he didn't have a hundred major leaguers that he'd fix their elbow. 
whereas this other guy did. And so that was a huge thing for me. So I did that. And another player got hurt right when I did. His name was Ben. And Ben and I were both left-handed pitchers. We were like rivals, you know, but like best friends or whatever as pitchers in, in the Florida team and then in the Texas team as well the next year. And both of us got hurt at the same time, like within weeks of each other. He had his surgery with the team doctor. I had my surgery with Lewis Yoakum from the Curlin Job Clinic in LA. And we did our rehab together. We did everything the same. And I made it back and got better. And he never did. And I always attributed that to the fact that he maybe, you know, had a little bit of a different priority because he was a tall, handsome, muscular guy and girls liked him a lot. And I was only focused on making a lot of money playing baseball. And that was my big thing. So I think the two of us, like we would do our physical therapy together. We'd go eat lunch together and we'd work out together. And then he would leave and go do other stuff. And I would go to Barnes and Noble and read books. And that's when I really, I would say my mental game took another gear because I literally missed 18 months from like August of 2003 until March of 2005. I didn't play and I had to substitute something. I had to keep my brain going and my competition going. So I would literally go to Barnes and Noble at off Bell Road in Peoria in Arizona. And I would like put in five to seven hours a day, like reading books. And you know, that was it. That was my day. I try to get as smart as I could. I bought books when I had the budget to, but like I said, in minor leagues, you don't have a lot of money. And so I would just go there and read like it was a library. And I read books on everything from physics to relationships to, you know, like running and nutrition. And I, I taught myself how to cook and all that stuff. And, and it really, you know, I think that was like my, that was the dip. That was the deepest dip. And I tripled down at that point with the personal improvement. And that made me stronger because it made me more well-rounded. And I really rebounded very well from that. Hmm. All right. It sounds like you really thrived in this sort of like capitalist system, whereas like in like high school and junior college and college, it, it was sort of like people had different priorities and they weren't necessarily, you know, giving credit based on merit, but it was just sort of like, do what we say. But now that you're in this capitalist thing, you're kind of like, okay, I have this laser focus and I'm going to make it work. How did that affect you going forward? Well, socially, it was hard because no, I, nobody wanted to be my friend, right? And I think that even on the when I got to professional baseball, it was only other guys that were major leaguers that adopted that same thing. Because a lot of players that are in the minor leagues, they kind of know. Like they have this sense that like they're not that good or they're not going to make it or maybe they're not willing to try. Because if you mm -hmm. give everything, like every freaking drop and every, you know, Frodo Baggins like toe hair to your <laughs> dream, then and, and you fail – then you're like, you really feel like a failure. You know what I mean? Mm. So I think a mm. lot of people hold back five or 10% of their p potential like investable time and energy in psychology so that they can say, well, you know what? Mm, it was bad luck. Like I probably could have done a little bit better. Like maybe I drank too much or maybe I just did this wrong and maybe they didn't like me and it was bullshit that they gave this other mm. guy a chance, but it never was. It, it was never bullshit, dude. I saw guys that had all kinds of chances to make it and that didn't. And every guy that had the stuff to make it and didn't make it, they had the inability or the unwillingness to learn a new skill to adapt. Because it's like you can't go as a one trick pony. You have to really have this well rounded, you know, like foundation. And you have to have these like this octopus arm approach of like, okay, I'll take information in, but then I have to process it, you know, from all these directions into my core. And then I have to evolve as a result of that information, whether it's scouting, say, this guy tries to do, swing at this pitch and he doesn't swing at that pitch or whatever. That's the thing that I guess gave me a social advantage was that I saw the weakness in other people's eyes, in their hearts and in their, in their work ethic. So I just put my headphones on and worked. And I felt like, okay, well, maybe I'll just make friends when I'm in the majors because these guys here, they don't want to, they really don't want to make it. And as a result of that, I can't waste time being friends with people that aren't going to be on the same level that, that are just going to hold themselves back. And then off the field, it was great because I had so many friends that were completely not in baseball at all. And <laughs> You know, and that was cool because they didn't even get it. They're like, so you're in the majors, right? And I'm like, no, I'm in double A. They're like, what does that even mean? I'm like, well, you know, when like you're on tour playing in this, like you're playing on OzFest and you're not like the headliner. They're like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like in the opening band. You know, it's like that because <laughs> I had a bunch of friends that were musicians and stuff and I had to try to relate it to that. So mm. it was cool. It was refreshing because then like when I pulled back after the season and I would come home, I had a roommate or like a bunch of roommates 
And I would just do stuff with them. And a lot of my friends were straight edge growing up and mm -hmm. through the minors and stuff. And so I had a lot of friends that didn't drink, didn't do drugs. And as a result of that, and I was straight edge as well. So we would do stupid shit like go cliff diving or break into wild rivers, which is a water park. And then we would like figure out how to turn on the rides and like, <laughs> you, know, you know, like stuff that's like, you could go all the way there, but if you add like one drop of alcohol, like people die, you know, <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah. it was like project mayhem stuff that we would do. And nobody, when I was there, nobody ever really got hurt, but we did have to like, you know, run away from the cops and things like that a couple of times, which was fun. <laughs> Always fun. All right. So you get into the major leagues. What was that like? It was amazing, right? I get called up and the guy that I got called up with had already been to the majors. So we get sent from Frisco, Texas to Miami to go pitch in like pro player stadium, which is really like one of the most miserable places in the sky <laughs> you can imagine. Cause it's like a billion degrees. It's sweaty. And I'm like, okay, well they just called me up, but there's no way they're going to make me pitch the first day. Like wrong. So they call me in, in like the fifth inning. Cause Kenny Rogers, who was pitching, he literally, it's a national league game, right? So mm -hmm. he hits a triple. It like, you know, which is hilarious. We're all laughing our asses off because he's like, at this point, I think he's like 36 years old or something like that. And he's like running around the bases. And he's, you know, like he's running like an old man. And then he gets <laughs> tired. And then the next inning he goes out and just gives up the booty and just like straight up just gets smashed because he was so tired from, you know, from running <laughs> the bases. So then I have to get called into the game. And I'm like, they call my name and they're like, all right, Wilson, get going. And at this point, like you don't really know many people, right? It's also a zero sum game. When you get called up, that means somebody else is getting sent down. So mm. I knew a couple people from spring training, you know, like a couple of the guys that were on the team and stuff like that, but I didn't really know a lot of the guys. So I got there and my Jersey said number 36 on it. And I was like, Oh my God, a good number. This uh -huh. is awesome. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't have like some number 71 or some bullshit that like doesn't make uh -huh. any sense, you know, like 36, that's like a real player's number. You know, these guys really uh -huh. like, me. and then I got called into pitch and as I'm warming up, I don't think I hit the catcher. Like, I think I bounced like four balls and like, threw one over. <laughs> it was embarrassing. It was like a water balloon fight. I just had no idea where anything was going. I was so amped up, you know, life dream, life dream. Here it is, right? Here it is. You're right there. It's right in front of you. So the second that I ran out onto the field, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I just have to go pitch now, you know? And then I became like, I like zoned in and I realized that all those like, you know, call them like Van Damme moments where I would like punish myself. All those things became a reward. Now, this was the reward for all of those things, I should say. So I ran out there and the first hitter I faced is a guy named Jeff Conine, who was like this super crusty veteran of <laughs> he'd been in baseball for like 12 years or something like that. So I proceed to get two strikes on him and then he fouls off like five pitches. And I'm like, damn, this guy's really good. And then I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, no shit, he's really good. He's in the major leagues, dumbass. Like, of course. So, you know, you have this inner dialogue with yourself. So eventually, like I throw a pitch down and away, he gets a hit. And the runner is on second base and the ball goes right to the right fielder and the right fielder throws the guy out at home plate. So the guy didn't even slide. He was just out. And then I was like, okay, I guess like that's it. And that was the third out of the inning. So I was like, all right, I gave up a hit, but got an out. So like, I didn't like nothing, like everything's fine. Like, everything's okay, guys. Like it's good. You know, like the fire burned itself out. We're good. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. Buck Showalter, who's the manager at the time, like I was the next batter, like based on where the position was. So he has me go out there and stand on the on deck circle. Like I'm going to hit. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to get to hit. And the guy pitching was Rick Helling. And Rick Helling at the time was at, towards the end of his career. And he's a great guy. He actually works for the players union now. So I can't say anything bad about him. But I was like, if I'm going to get a hit off, off somebody, I'm going to get a hit off Rick Helling. Like this dude throws like 89, you know, like I got a chance. So I stand out there and I'm like taking swings and I'm like measuring him, trying to get my timing right or whatever, you know. And I'm about to go up to, to bat and show Walter and the whole dugout starts fucking laughing. Like they're just cracking their asses up in the middle of the game. And they're fucking laughing so hard. And like they're just dying laughing. Like the Dominican guys are like, no, 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 come on, dude. And, uh, and then show Walter's like, hey, I'm not going to let you hit. Like, what are you thinking? And I'm like, I can hit, Buck. And he goes, yeah, I got Delucci for that. They put in Delucci to pinch hit, which means that I'm basically done pitching that day. They're okay. going to bring some other reliever in after him after me because they, they have a pinch hitter so he goes in there like pops up the second pitch and i go really buck like that <laughs> <laughs> like i could have done that shit, man you know and you know so it's funny but then i'm thinking like dude i got an out in the big leagues that's pretty cool like mm -hmm. i made it i made it to the major leagues nice. 
And then the next day, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I go home, ride the bus home. Like we're staying in like Ball Harbor or something like that in Miami, somewhere swanky. And, you know, I'm like feeling pretty jazzed because I'm like, ah, they're not going to make me pitch back to back days. Like they just, (laughs) there's no way they're going to do that. So then of course, like same exact thing happens, like two outs, you know, middle of the game, they bring me in to face Carlos Delgado, who at that point had, I think he probably had already hit 300 home runs in the majors. Like this is like a legit world series level player, like all-star. He was in the home run derby and stuff like that. And I go through this really long at bat with him and I end up striking him out. And then as I'm running off the field at that point, I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, I just struck out like a potential hall of fame player. Like Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can do this. Like I can really, I can stay, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that was it. That's when I knew I really had everything it took because I had some spring training success. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I faced a couple of really good hitters in spring training and, you know, struck them out or whatever and got some outs and stuff like that. And I felt good about myself, but then like doing that in a game where I had like a mental plan. And so Carlos Delgado, he's a left-handed hitter, but he hits left-handed pitchers really well because most lefty pitchers have a good curveball and he hammers curveballs. So I know that he hammers curveballs, but he doesn't know that I know that he hammers curveballs, right? (laughs) So the whole thing when you're throwing different pitches, the idea is to like masquerade the spin direction so that people can't see how the ball is spinning. So if you throw a fastball, it spins backwards. And if you Mm -hmm. you throw a curveball, it spins forwards, but like on the same axis, like Mm. top spin. So Mm. in warmups, I was like, my whole goal was to get this guy to think I was going to throw him a curveball with the game on the line. And then I was going to throw a fastball. So it's called pitching backwards, basically. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. most pitchers, especially like a lefty, like I was at the time facing a lefty, their out pitch is a slider or a curveball. But Mm -hmm. I saw this hole in his swing. Like I just see it. Like it just makes sense geometrically. Like there's this thing right above his belt that like if I throw a four seamer there and he's not ready for it, he won't hit it, you know, because it's like borderline. So I'll throw it and he'll miss it. Uh, Not because I feel like I have like this great fastball that nobody can hit because that wasn't the case. I threw like 92 miles an hour. But what happened was I threw like six curveballs in warmups, right? So I come into the game just to face him. He knows that I know it. I'm like curveball, 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 curveball. I'm like, this guy's sitting there thinking, oh, dude, I'm going to fucking murder one of these curveballs. And so then I throw him like a four seamer, a two seamer, a slider, you know, like all these pitches. And I get him to like a three ball, two strike count. And this is the point where like the wipeout curveball would be the perfect pitch, right? In a traditional scenario. But I had planted this seed in his head. So he's sitting on the curveball at this point. He's like, he's like, this little kid is going to throw me a curveball and I'm going to hit it off the freaking second deck. I'm going to flip my bat and then I'm going to smoke a cigar in the dugout. And I throw him a four seam fastball and he has this little tiny hesitation like, oh shit, it's not a curveball and tries to swing at it and misses it. And I saw the look in his face and he was like, that (laughs) motherfucker set me up. (laughs) <laughs> and then, and so I looked at him and I'm like, I set you up, you know? And then Sandy Alomar Jr., who's Puerto Rican and Delgado's Puerto Rican, yells at him, he's got a fastball too, dumbass, and like runs off the field, <laughs> you know? And it was the best moment because it's like you have these two guys that had known each other for 20 years. And Sandy basically knew what I was trying to do because I talked to him and he was a really like a veteran player. Like he was like a G.I. Joe action figure of a baseball player. <laughs> and, so I'm running off the field and Sandy was like, dude, that shit was tight. I'm never going to let him hear the end of that. I'm like, it was worth it. Like that's worth everything. He goes, that's how you do it. That's what mm-hmm. you do. Just keep doing that shit and you'll be good. You'll be a really good kid. And I was like, okay, thanks man. And he was like 40, right? And I'm like 24 at the time. So this is like the guy I looked up to. I saw him play on TV when I was a kid and he's like, and I'm like playing catch with him. So there's all these surreal moments that happen when you get to really like play against your heroes or play with your heroes. And it really is the best thing ever. I mean, it's the best thing to experience that type of stuff. And, and this was like, I had a lot of ups and downs personally along the way, like 2005 and 2006 were extremely rough for me personally. I was in like a really bad relationship. You know, the girl I was dating, her family ended up getting arrested for like doing a Ponzi scheme. So that was really a negative thing. And then like my grandfather died. And so like that two year period, I don't really remember a lot of it. I just remember being like, Baseball saved me from all the emotional distress that I had, that I was going through at the time in 2005 and 2006, like my first like year, year and a half of the majors. And it really cemented my love for baseball because I looked at it as a sort of dependency thing at that point, but I was also rewarded. I'd work really hard. I would do well, you know, and it was like, there was a direct relationship there between my effort level and my luck, you know, whereas off the field, I felt like I had a lot of bad luck and 
I always feel like, you know, karma puts you in the right place at the right time. And this is exactly what I needed to do. So I didn't even go home that off season. I just stayed there and I lived in Dallas and, and worked out and tried to be like part of the fabric of the Dallas thing and all that stuff playing for the Rangers. And it was a really good experience. It was great because I really felt like, okay, I'm completely on my own now. Like, and I have nobody and I have to do this on my own, but I have the beginnings, you know, I have like some, I've had some, I'm sparking the rocks now, you know, I haven't quite caught fire, but I'm sparking the rocks and I'm seeing Flint fall into the sawdust pile. You know what I mean? And my hands were sore and all that stuff, but I was, it was getting close to seeing the results. Hmm. Well, it's amazing that you say you don't remember much of it, but you can tell me like what pitch like you gave to Carlos Delgado, like, you know, 18 years ago or something like that. Like, that's crazy how much you remember of it. And the thing that strikes me about like your thought process and everything was that there was a ton of game theory involved in it. It's almost like you studied it. Yeah, well, I was a chess player, you know, Mm -hmm. and I really was good at like critical thinking games, puzzles. I was always like a Lego builder, you know, like hardcore Lego builder, uh, video gamer, you know. So for me, that imagination quantity of like putting myself in a critical situation and thinking my way out of it and trying to strategize my way out of it, it was what really helped because I wasn't physically overpowering anybody. I was a regular sized guy for a baseball player. And I wasn't one of these freaks that could just like lean back and throw the ball 100 miles an hour. So I learned how to throw a little bit harder here and there because I would I watch these other people throw that were like maybe a little bit bigger than me or a little bit like physically like more imposing. But then I would see they would do these little tricks like AJ Burnett was a pitcher for the Marlins at the time. And he did this thing where like his toe was like up when he would stride and then his toe would like open up like his heel was down on the ground almost. And right before his like whole foot hit, his front foot went whoop, and like open just like one degree. And I would see that and I would be like, holy shit, is that why he throws so hard? So then that whole off season, I was just like thinking about it and I would stand in the mirror and like practice it like, cause it's a timing thing. So when you're adding like a link to your kinetic chain, you know, cause you have this movement, right? Where you like start the generation of like ground force with your feet and then your hips and then your torso and then your shoulder and then your wrist and your elbow, like all whoop, like whip it at the last little bit, kind of like a tennis serve. If you've, you know, if you can think of that in really slow motion. So that if you add a link at the right point, you can actually increase your acceleration because you're adding like more acceleration time, you know, mm-hmm. and the way acceleration works is the longer you're accelerating, the faster the projectile comes out. So it's almost like if you take like, like a hockey puck and you slap it, then it's going to go out at whatever velocity that you can get that at. But if you take your, if you take the puck from like really far back and you mm-hmm. sling it mm-hmm. and then it can go just as fast if you're on it a long time. And so that's sort of the way that golf or, or baseball work is they have that sort of elliptical acceleration that help mm-hmm. out a lot, you know? Well, wow. I mean, I'm learning so much about baseball. Like, I feel like I'm getting into the innards of like what's actually going through your body and, you know, like resulting in the ball launching. And, you know, like we tend to think of it as kind of a simple game, but seem to be many layers to it. Yeah. I mean, some people intrinsically pick things up because they're practicing something and they're good at it. So they get reinforced and they, they don't really know what it is, but I was more like externally viewing myself, you know, in like mentally. So I was like, I had like the roving camera where I would imagine myself in these different body positions, pause, but I would like, (laughs) you know, try to get like stretched out and figure out how I could torque. And like, does this look the way Mariano Rivera throws, or does this look the way Nolan Ryan throws, or does this look the way that, you know, King Griffey Jr. hits or whatever. So you start analyzing yourself and you stand in the mirror and you're like, well, this is what that guy looks like this on TV. Here's a baseball card of him. And I would like tape it to the mirror and be like, okay, let me get in that posture. Let me try this. And when you mimic that and you can see it, then it it really turns into this thing where I'm sure it's just like coding, right? Like you can, like some people, you're going to read what they wrote and you're going to be like, oh, I like the way they did that. And other people are going to be like, oh, he just, this is all garbled. Like, this is like, there's just too much (laughs) shit in here, you know? And you can Mm -hmm. see that you can see wasted motion. You know, Mm. and when there's somebody that has a really elegant form, like a ballerina or something like that, and they move, Mm. there's a sort of like human to human admiration where you're like, wow, that's incredible. That's just amazing. Mm. It's the same way when we watch like gymnastics or whatever. So I would watch pitchers the way people watch the Olympics, you know, Mm. and I'd be like, Mm. oh, look at that thing. He does that thing where like his shoulders are still like backwards, but his hips are forwards and there's like this lag. And then so then you see somebody like whip through after the being laggy. And you're like, oh, shit, that's wild. Like, that's, I need to try that. So then you start experimenting with stuff. And then, 
it's so much of a, is like geometry. So you're sitting there thinking like, oh, well, if I throw the ball at this trajectory and I get it to like kink and I get to like turn, then I can make the pitch this shape. And you start thinking about stuff like that. Now they do all that now. And there's actually like, there's literally apps for that that do like crazy slow motion video. And they teach people how to like harness their spin axis. I was doing it all by feel and like observation. So I would throw the ball and like try to look really hard at the ball while it was spinning. And then I would take a ball and like draw with it on like a draw on the ball with a marker. And then I would try to make like shapes on the ball and like spin the ball into a shape. So I would have like black ink on one side and no ink on the other side. And I'd try to throw a pitch so I could only see the black ink or only see the white ink or the white, you know, leather of the ball. And those types of like science experiments were really, they took me to like a whole nother level. Cause then I would actually do this thing where I would put baseballs on the ground. And I did this like in high school and junior college and everybody thought I was a fucking psychopath, but I would put baseballs on the ground, like a bowling lane. And I would try to make like the shape of the pitch so I could see it, you know, like on the ground while I was throwing and I try to like track the ball over those balls and see like the shape of like where it was crossing over and things like that. Because then you could get a sense for how deceptive the pitches come out all the same and then they, their spin takes over and they divert. So the idea is like you want the ball to come out for like 30 feet straight and then go boom, and then divert from that tunnel. And that's there's a guy called Pitching Ninja that's on Twitter and he shows videos of like guys highlights where like and he does a graphical overlay. So like the ball comes out and he's like, here's a change up and a slider and a fastball from the same pitcher. Here's an overlay. The ball just comes out and, goes, and just like splits into four pieces. And that's really what it seems like to a hitter because you have this memory of repetition to say like, okay, I just saw this happen. If he does that again, I'm going to clobber it. And so you have this kind of like tunnel geometry, kind of like spatial recognition to say like, okay, it's just like parking a car. You're like, you know, you get a gauge that you're like, okay, I can move up like another foot before I hit this guy. And it's kind of the same thing with hitting. So I learning that and knowing that as a hitter, I was able to take that same tunnel idea and turn it around and think about the hitter's tunnel and what he was seeing from me even though I never got video of myself growing up, like the angle that I wanted to get, you know, the, the video quality is really shitty when you're like an amateur. And then as you get older, you get more access. And that and I like, once I got access to that data, I was like untouchable because then I was able to say, Oh, this guy literally can't hit home runs if I throw it right here. And then I was able to <laughs> memorize that, you know, using the handy dandy four colored pen, I would make notes <laughs> using the four colored pen. Well, so that's an interesting aspect of baseball that I don't think I really thought too much about. But how much of it is studying and how much of it is like just practicing and, you know, doing stuff in the game and things like that? I would say that a lot of it is understanding what's happening or what just happened and being able to adjust before something more drastic happens. So if you throw a pitch and a guy swings at it, you have to be able to replay that or observe that in a replay state like a RAM. You have to have enough RAM mentally that you can like watch it happen once or twice, like after it happens to say, oh, was he late on that or was he just underneath it? Or was he trying to hit it this way? Or, you know, so I would think about it like that. And then as a result, I would try to stay a step ahead and make an adjustment off of the pitch that I just threw. So it was never random, you know, like the pitches were linked to me in sequence to say, if a guy's late, I'm going to try to make him even more late because he's going to try to get on, get earlier if he's late. If he's early, he's going to try to slow down. So I have to prevent that from happening. You know, I have to throw a pitch that diverts that comfort level. And a, one of the things is people are kind of scared of the ball, right? So if you throw a ball close enough to a person, like they get a little bit wound up, they get a little bit pissed off. They, visually, they just don't like it. They're like, oh man, that, that almost hit me. I was always able to use that sort of, I don't want to call it a fear factor because I, I wasn't that scary. I was, I'm not some big, I'm like six one. I'm not like some huge imposing guy, but I would throw really, really, really close to people so that they either thought that I was crazy or I had no control or I was a dickhead. And all three of those things were good because it allowed me to unlock other combinations based off that diverting their attention, if that makes sense. <laughs> so I used to use yeah. this, I used to use sequencing that I would call leading and opening. You lead the eyes somewhere, it's like a magic trick. And you lead the eyes a certain direction and then you're opening up another part of the zone, right? So you lead them inside, they're looking inside and then down and away is open. But if you just stay down and away, you lead them that way and you stay on it, you have to make increasingly perfect pitches because they know exactly what you're doing, right? So then you're opening <laughs> up inside, then you throw a pitch that's really close to them that kind of changes directions and comes back over the plate. And then they're like, oh, this guy's a dickhead. I'm over this. And then you would see these like 
superstar players completely mail it in at that point because a guy that's making 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year, he doesn't want to get hit on a bony part of his body, like his forearm or his hand or his elbow, because then he's going to miss games and not be able to hit his 30 or 40 home runs that he's supposed to hit. So he's like, you know what? I'm cool. I'll just not get any hits today. Like if he throws, unless he makes a mistake, I'm not going to hang out over the plate and risk going on the disabled list with a broken arm. (laughs) And I use that to my advantage every time I could. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So we've talked a lot about your career. How did you get into Bitcoin? I thought Bitcoin was a scam. 2016, 2017, I had heard about magic internet money and I saw the number go up and I was like, this is nuts. Like, how is this going to end? Like, how is it like, this is going to end really bad for a lot of people. And so I stayed out of it. I did really well with gold and foreign exchange trading in 2008, 2009. And that was sort of how I cut my teeth as like a really active trader. And then, so, you know, the rest of the time, I just kind of sat it out. I didn't really, I wasn't really very aggressive in in the markets as, you know, because I was doing other stuff. I I had car dealerships and, you know, I was trading cars and selling cars and running businesses and all that crap for like my spare juice. And then, you know, like 2018, after Bitcoin dumped, I started really thinking about it. Like, well, why didn't it go to zero? Like, it's got to have some sort of value. Otherwise, it would have gone to zero. Like, if it drops from 20 to 3,000, like, why not just drop all the way to 1,000 or 500? And that's really when I started studying it. And then I was like, oh, shit, man, I totally missed this. I like completely missed this. I was looking at this all wrong. I was listening to like MSNBC. And then I started doing some research and asking a lot of questions. And then I was like, wait a second, hang on. You can trade this stuff 24 seven, like all day you can trade. You don't have like, it doesn't stop. This is great. I'm an insomniac. I get to do something like at 11 o'clock at night and still be productive. And so that's kind of what got me into it was the ability to trade 24 seven. And then I got really, you know, really into it. But at that whole time that I was accumulating Bitcoin or or trading, I was doing it wrong. I should have been, you know, if I would have had you, Jimmy or American model or somebody to tell me not to sell the Bitcoin, then I would have done a lot better. But, you know, I ended up doing okay. And then like, you know, 19, you know, I had some guys scam me. And then like later 19, 20, then I started really killing it and then doing really well. So from there, it was kind of good. Wow. Ah, Wow. It's interesting because you've come into this community and you seem like an old hand. I didn't really even realize you were a baseball player until, you know, you were talking about it. (laughs) Like, it seems like you've never really fit in anywhere, period. And like this, but within the Bitcoin community, you seem to fit in. What do you think that is? I think it's the sort of... It's a sort of mindset that a lot of people that have it a certain way, you know, like I grew up in Huntington Beach. It wasn't like I grew up in Baghdad or some like war torn area. A lot of people were like, why would you want to leave Huntington Beach? Like Huntington Beach is nice. And I'm like, yeah, it's nice, but it's not like doing anything, right? Like going to the beach and surfing is not really like, it's not making the world a better place. It's not making the world, you know, like more important or anything like that. So I just didn't really, I didn't really want to end up where I started, you know? So I always wanted to make big progress. And that that's, I guess, why I've always been macroeconomic aware. And I would, you know, I like to travel a lot. So I was always interested in, in what's going on with the government, you know, what's going on in, with foreign policy and things like that. And that's really what drove my investing thesis constantly was, can I do something that protects myself? Because I knew at some point my baseball earnings would run out and I needed to have something to do, you know, in my 40s and 50s that was going to make me financially viable. So I think it's just sort of a personality thing for me that I'm an achiever and I just want to go run as fast as I can run. And if people don't want to catch up, then fine. But I think because I got kind of screwed with Bitcoin at first and I did mistakes, I did, you know, I did my Hail Satoshis for for shitcoining and stuff like that. You know, I did trade a lot of shitcoins and stuff along the way to learn, you know, just the trading pairs and trading volume and stuff like that. And I was trying a lot of different theories, but I really got to the point where I said, okay, forget it. I'm just going to start dip buying and accumulating Bitcoin because it's really the, the the right thing to do. And, you know, I did that, I guess, maybe a couple months before I signed up for Clubhouse. And then I was all of a sudden like, oh my God, I'm not a moron. Oh God, other people do. <laughs> it is, this is the way, this is the way. And, and then, you know, cause like my whole time I would tell people, I'm like, guys, this Bitcoin stuff is great. You should check it out. You should put some money in it. Like just buy some yourself and like sit on it. They're like, well, I'll give you money to trade for me. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I totally want to do that, but it's not like necessary. I said, you don't have to do it. Just buy it and hold it, you know? But I did have a couple of people give me money to trade for them and I did make money for them. And then, then, then it was like a wildfire. They're like, dude, CJ, I gave him like 10 grand and he gave me 35 grand back. And I'm like, yeah, well I made money for you. Like, there you go. Take it. Like I, I want it off my plate. Now I just want to focus on myself and be selfish. Like get out of here. 
So it was kind of funny, but obviously that, that's easy to do when Bitcoin goes up, you know, a couple hundred percent. I sadly, the thing is that I, I should have done better, you know, realistically, if I would have just held on to it, but I was an idiot and was like trading for fiat. And I kept having to buy in at like higher prices. And that, that was the problem. That's when I realized that this was like a boat that was going to leave at some point and I wanted to be on it. Hmm. And so are you a holder now? What's your sort of future looking like with respect to Bitcoin? Yeah. I mean, what I'm trying to do now is integrate it into more business activities to the point where I'm trying to get people to pay for cars using cryptocurrency. You know, I'm trying to figure out other ways of getting Bitcoin people into other businesses or other businesses into Bitcoin. I'm working on a, uh, a content thing right now. I had somebody hit me up and I had a really good conversation with one of these Bitcoin funds and I'm exploring the possibility of doing a, like a, a media series for them, I'm trying to get some retired baseball players and current baseball players into it, kind of like the Russell O'Kung thing for their own benefit. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to get anything out of those things. I'm just like trying to educate them to shake them, you know, like put my hands on their shoulders and shake them and be like, you're making millions of dollars. Do this for yourself <laughs> now before it's worthless. Don't make the mistake I did and try to invest in businesses. It's fiat mining is a fucking waste. But, you know, I mean, I can't really complain about how the business does as a car dealer, but I can definitely say that if I would have, you know, the same thing, right? Like if I would have gone back to when I got into the car dealership thing and just bought supercars and Bitcoin, I would have done way, I would have outperformed what I'm doing right now. You know, hmm. that's the, that's the thing that I've got to live with. And my, my poor wife has to live with along the way, but you know, I think you've done okay. Just, just, I'll just say it. Yeah, it'll be okay. But no, I had people, you know, I had, this is the problem with running a remote business sometimes is like I had somebody embezzle money from the store and I had to sue him and I had another guy take out a loan against like the proceeds of the store and I had to fire him and like, you know, sell the business as a result. So, you know, I've have had some, I've had a much more valuable education, I would say in business, which makes me a really good operator, but also makes things really frustrating because, you know, when you have all these other people that could potentially, you know, I guess, damage your business, you have a lot of surface attack or attack surface, I guess. Right. You know, I, we had to defend ourselves against like a, a, like a fraudulent slip and fall accident and things like just things like that. That's what happens when you're running a regular business. And that's, what's frustrating because, you know, I feel like I could probably do a little bit better if I was just focusing more on the Bitcoin investing thing or whatever. But, you know, that's the future for me. The future for me is blending and getting more, more no coiners into Bitcoin. So that way we can create like, these kind of Bitcoin bridges to, you know, things like that. So I have a program that I'm working on right now for, with a, a local team, a software developing company to do some like farming, like literally. So working Bitcoin into the profitability of the farming to get the treasury holding Bitcoin and things like that and showing them some metrics on, on how they can kind of put that together. Cause you know, as like a pretty, I guess you'd say like quantitative trader mentally, like I show people some of the, I, I try to find the angles, right. And say, Hey, listen, if you make X amount of percentage, instead of buying more equipment, like just delay that by six months and buy a little bit of Bitcoin every couple months. And then you'll see that, how that plays out. And you do that like retroactively, you show them the numbers and they're like, Oh yeah, I need to get into this. And farmers are very <laughs> like libertarian, you know, they're very mm -hmm. like, they want to do things themselves and they want their own destiny to be you know decided. So it's kind of an interesting community to be in here in Fresno, where I see a lot of people that are interested in it and figuring out clean energy and all these types of things that we talk about. I, that type of stuff is very important for, for the farmer people that I'm dealing with on the investment side. Oh, that's awesome. It sounds like you're trying to spread the good word on Bitcoin, as it were. So are there any like of your former teammates that you've gotten into Bitcoin or anything? I have a couple of teammates that I'm talking to right now mm. and a couple of former like team employees that I'm talking to. And one of them was listening to like a cafe Bitcoin room this morning when I was, <laughs> when I was driving and I got on there to talk about something. There's this one guy that always talks about real estate. And then I came in to be like, Hey, listen, like you can't compare these two things, it's, you know? And then he was talking about like ETFs and I'm like, listen, ETFs don't trade on weekends, just FYI. So that doesn't, that's not why the price went from 61 to 55. It has nothing to do with ETFs, you know, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like then he, this guy texted me and this is a guy that like, I believe he works in like a front office capacity now. So like on the mm -hmm. business side for a team. And he was mm -hmm. like, dude, this room's awesome. Can I talk to you about Bitcoin? And I was like, yeah, sure. He goes, okay, <laughs> call me after this time. So I actually, after this, I'm going to call him and see what kind of questions I can answer. This is like this guy in particular, he's kind of a ringleader. He has a lot of guys that he works with. So I just want to be able to like 
go talk to about 10 guys and do like the sort of Michael Saylor thing for some baseball <laughs> players and get them to like think about it a little bit so they're not thinking about, you know, buying Rolexes and, you know, like a boat or whatever. <laughs> Indeed. That would be amazing. All right. So where can people find you? Where can they contact you if needed? Yeah, I think the easiest way is like, you know, my Instagram is CJ Wilson photo. I have another one called supercar underscore CJ, where it's just like just car content. But my the supercar CJ one is probably the easiest one. And then I tweet also, but my Twitter is like straight edge racer with an eight instead of the like a so it's like str eight, the letter eight or the uh, number eight, and then edge racer like I like to race cars. And, you know, there's a couple of other CJ Wilsons out there. I'm not either one of those guys. There's actually an actor named CJ Wilson. So I get retweeted in his stuff all the time, but it, that's not me either. I'm just the, I'm a guy that likes to, it, all my tweets are basically Bitcoin and baseball related at this point, but hopefully at some point I'm able to get this, this media idea off the ground and do a really funny, like cartoon series that people are able to watch and, and helps them grok Bitcoin a little bit better and helps them take control of their financial future a little bit and and at least make the most informed decision possible. Because I think the hardest thing for a lot of people is they're looking at something that is very intimidating, very technical in a lot of ways, but they're missing the simple parts, which is the the scarcity argument and the macroeconomic argument. When you look at those and you blend those together, it's a very, it's a very like thoughtful thing to do for your future. You know, if you can think about it that way in a savings account. Yeah, indeed it is. All right. So one thing, I think this episode will go out on April Fool's Day. So just for that, can you do like an impression of Bitcoin Tina for me? Yes, I was. Uh, you got halfway through the ask and I was like, is he going to ask me to do Tina? <laughs> Shoot, I'm, I'm like, I'm like dry throat right now. Thinking about it. Listen, the really important thing you have to understand is we Bitcoin doesn't need you. If you don't want to get here, you're wrong. That's it. Like, I don't have time to tell you the gauge theory doesn't matter. <laughs> all that matters is the scarcity that this will suck. It will break all of your models. It will break all of them. I've been doing this a long time and nothing will suck assets out of other assets like Bitcoin. That's the, that's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> that was awesome. Anyway, for all you Clubhouse fans out there, I think you'll appreciate what CJ, I've heard him do this. It's it's awesome. I Totally enjoyed that. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. I hope to uh, meet you in person one day and get you to autograph the five books that I bought off of Amazon that you wrote. So um, <laughs> I bought a couple of copies. I'm actually using like a little Bitcoin book as a kind of primer for people. Instead of giving them the like, I don't have time for you. I just say, hey, listen, <laughs> I'm going to give you this and you're going to give it back to me in like a day or two. And you're going to ask me so many more questions as a result because you're going to be like, I'm in. You know, and I think that book is so concise it's very helpful for a lot of people so oh. appreciate it. i appreciate what you've done for the community because you take people like me that are sort of like financially aware and you take us to another level with your explanations for things you know so thank you well thank you cj this was absolutely wonderful well that wraps it up for this episode of bitcoin fixes this cj can be found at at straight edge racer on twitter until next time, Fiat Delinda Est.